Section One of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Lost Diaries by Maurice Baring. From the Diary of Smith Minor. St. James School, September. 1884 Sunday Yesterday afternoon was a half holiday we were playing prisoners base except four boys who were gardening with Mrs. Wickham. Peel hit Bell by mistake with all his force with a pickaxe on Bell's wrist. Sunday Last night there was a total eclipse of the moon. We all stayed up to see it. It looked very funny. There was a shadow right over the moon. We began football yesterday. At tea, the head asked if anyone had eaten chestnuts in the garden. Simon's major said yes at once. Then the head said he was sure others had, too. Then Wilson stood up, and after a time, seven chaps stood up. Then the head said it would be the worse for those who didn't stand up, as he knew who the culprits were. I hadn't eaten any, but Anderson had given me a piece off his knife, so I stood up, too. The head said we should all have two hours extra work. He was very waxy. He said we were unreliable. Sunday. Yesterday we all photographed. Symes laughed and was sent to bed for misbehavior. Pork's people came down yesterday. We call Pork Hog because he's dirty. He showed them over the school and turned on the electric light. The head was looking through the curtain in the library and saw this. When his people went away, Hog was sent for, and he is to be swished tomorrow. We told him he would get it hot and he blubbed. Sunday. We went for the choir expedition last Thursday. It was great fun. We went to London by the 835 train. We missed the train. So we went by the 853. We got to London at 1015. We then went to the mint we first saw the silver melted and made into thick tablets. Then we saw it rolled out into thin bits, then cut, stamped, and weighed. Then we had a very good luncheon and went to the tower. We first saw the bloody tower where the little princes were murdered. Then we saw the jewels the warder said the queen's crown was worth over one million pounds. Then we saw the armory and the tortures. Then we went to Madame Tussauds. It was quite a large building, now with large staircase. Then we had tea and went home. Sunday I said to Anderson that we might start an aquarium, but he said Ferguson had one last term, and that it would be copying. He said he hates copying, so we'll have a menagerie instead with lizards. Sunday. The lizard is very well indeed, and he has eat a lot of worms. White Cheek Jones, Ma, and Max, so they must fight it out in the playroom in the hour. They fought with gloves. White gave him a bloody nose. We had a very good game of football yesterday. Williams and Pierce, which left last term, came from Eton to play. Pierce changed to my room. He says you don't say squit at Eton, and you say me tutors, not my tutors. The fireworks are in a week. Saturday. There was no work this morning, as it was All Saints Day. There was a football match against another school, Reynolds. We won by three goals and three tries. There was an awful row on Wednesday. Anderson cut off a piece of his hair. Mac nabbed it, and he said he hadn't as he was afraid of the consequences. Then a search was made, and they found a piece of hair in his drawer. Mac told him he would find himself in Queer Street, and Collie said when he was writing home on Sunday that he had better add that he was a liar. Nothing happened till Monday and Anderson thought it was forgotten, but at reading over when the third division came up, the head said, Anderson, I am astounded at you. You are a shuffler and worse. He lost fifty marks and was swished. He would get twenty, the head said, if he did it again, and would be turned out of the choir. Sunday When Collie was out of the room and set three this morning, Mason said he wouldn't sneak about me talking if I didn't sneak about him, so I talked. When Collie came back, Mason sneaked. Please, sir, will you ask Smith not to talk? I had to stand on the stool of penitence. We are going to put Mason in Coventry because he always sneaks 
just after he has sworn he won't last night we all had to play our pieces in the drawing-room i played a duet with wilson me astley played best when everybody had played their pieces we had ginger beer and biscuits and went to bed fish played worst on the violin sunday we had fireworks on the fifth ramen candles rockets crackers squibs and a set piece with god save the queen on it they came from brock's who makes the fireworks at the crystal palace we burnt a man in effigy a man with collars and an axe the head said he wouldn't say who it was meant to be but that all true englishmen who were not traitors could guess rowley said it was meant to be mr gladstone but he only said this to get a rise out of pork whose pater is a liberal it was really guy fox then pork said anderson's father was a liberal too and anderson hit him in the eye the head hates liberals there was another row this week christie said something to broadwood at breakfast that the porridge was mighty good that was copying anderson who'd learned it from his mater who was a yankee mac asked him what he'd said he said he'd said the porridge was good mac asked is that all you've said christie got very red and looked as if he was going to blub and said that was all very well said mac come afterwards mac reported him for telling bungs he wasn't swish as it's his first term but mac told him he was making himself very unpopular on tuesday fatty the butler came into the third division schoolroom with a message someone said in a whisper hello fatty mac nabbed it and said who said that nobody answered then mac said he knew it was middleton me as he had recognized his voice middleton swore he hadn't said a word but he was reported and swished he still swears he didn't say fatty and i believe it was pork the other day at french campbell went up to collie and asked him what was wrong with less tables it had a pencil cross on it collie said that when he'd corrected it there was no s there campbell swore there was collie held the paper to the window and said he saw the ink of the s was fresh then christie began to blub and said he had done it and collie said it was for jerry and wrote forger in white chalk on his back and said he would tell the chaps in the first division but he didn't report him to the head which was awfully decent of him because christie is a new chap sunday trials are nearly over we had latin g and greek g paper yesterday set by the head there are only two more papers geography and latin verse the concert is on saturday pork sister is called jane campbell saw it on the seal of a letter he got his people were coming for the concert but he's written to tell them not to as we told him the head thought liberals worse than thieves end of section one Section 2 of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lost Diaries by Maurice Baring. Section 2. From the Diary of Isolde of Brittany. May 1st. Mama sent me up a message early this morning to say that I was to put on my best white gown with my coral necklace as guests were expected. She didn't say who. Nurse was in a fuss and pulled my hair when she did it, and made my face very sore by scrubbing it with a pumice stone. I can't think why, as there was no hurry. I came down punctually at noon. Mama and Papa were sitting in the hall, waiting. Fresh rushes were strewn on the floor. I was told to get out my harp and to sit with my back to the light. I hadn't practiced for weeks, and I can only play one song properly, the Mallard, a Cornish song. When I told Mama that was the only song I knew, she said I was on no account to mention it if I was asked to play, but I was only to play Breton songs. I said I didn't know any. She said that didn't matter, but that I could sing anything I knew and call it a Breton song. I said nothing, but I thought, and I still think, this was dishonest. Besides, the only songs that I know are quite new. The stable people whistle them, and they come from Rome. We waited a long time. Papa and Mama were both very fidgety, and Mama kept on pulling me about and telling me that my hair was badly done and that she could see daylight between the pleats of my frock. I nearly cried, and Papa said, Leave the dear child alone. She's very good. After we'd been waiting about twenty minutes, the trumpet sounded, and Morgan the Seneschal walked in very slowly and announced, Sir Tristram of Leoness. 
rather an oldish man walked in with a reddish beard and many wrinkles one of his front teeth was broken and the other was black he was dressed in a coat of mail which was too tight for him he had nice eyes and seemed rather embarrassed mamma and papa made a great fuss about him and brought me forward and said this is our daughter isolde and mamma whispered to me show your hands i didn't want to do this as nurse had scrubbed them so hard that they were red sir tristram bowed deeply and seemed more and more embarrassed after a long pause he said it's a very fine day isn't it before i had time to answer mamma broke in by saying isolde has been up since six with the falconers this wasn't true and i was surprised that mamma should be so forgetful i hadn't been out with the hawkers for weeks then dinner was served. It lasted for hours, I thought, and the conversation flagged terribly. Corneval, Sir Tristram's squire, had twice of everything, and drank much more cider than was good for him. After dinner, Mamma told me to fetch my harp and to sing a Breton song. I was just going to say I didn't know one, when she frowned at me so severely that I didn't dare. So I sang the Provencal orchard song about waking up too early, that Caradac the groom taught me. Sir Tristram said, charming charming that's german isn't it how well taught she is i do like good singing then he yawned although he tried not to and papa said he was sure sir tristram was tired and that he would take him to see the stables sir tristram then became quite lively and said he would be delighted when they'd gone mamma scolded me and said that i had behaved like a ninny and that she didn't know what our guest would think of me it seemed to me we only had one guest but i didn't say so then she told me to go and rest so as to be ready for dinner I forgot to say that just as Sir Tristram was going out of the room, he said to Papa, "'Your daughter's name is, er—' uh... And Papa said, "'Yes, Isolde, after her aunt.' And Sir Tristram said, "'Oh, what a pretty name!' May 6th. They have been here a week now, and I haven't seen much of them, because Sir Tristram has been riding with Papa nearly all day and every day. But every day after dinner, Mamma makes me sing the Provencal song, and every time I sing it, Sir Tristram says— charming charming that's german isn't it although i've already told him twice now that it isn't i like sir tristram only he's very silent and after dinner he becomes sleepy directly just like papa may seventh i've had a most exciting day papa and mamma sent for me and when i came into the room they were both very solemn and said they had something particular to say to me then mamma cried and papa tried to soothe her and said it's all right it's all right and then he blurted out that I was to marry Sir Tristram next Wednesday. I cried, and Papa cried, and Mamma cried, and then they said I was a lucky girl, and Mamma said that I must see about my clothes at once. May 8th. Nurse is in a fearful temper. She says we shall never be ready by Wednesday, and that it's more than flesh and blood can stand to worry folks like this. But Mamma is in the best of tempers. Sir Tristram has gone away to stay with some friends. He's coming back on Tuesday night. My wedding gown is to be made of silver with daisies worked in it. The weavers are working day and night, but most of the stuff is old. It belonged to Mamma. I do think that they might have given me a new gown. Blanche had a new one when she was married. May 12th. The wedding went off very well. I had four maidens and four pages. After Mass we had a long feast. Papa made a speech and broke down, and Tristram made a speech and got into a muddle about my name, and everybody was silent. Then he said I had beautiful hands, and everybody cheered. After supper we were looking out on the sea, and just as Tristram was becoming talkative, I noticed that he wore another ring besides his wedding ring, a green one made of jasper. I said, What a pretty ring! Who gave it to you? He said, Oh, a friend, and changed the subject. Then he said he was very tired and went away. May 13th. It's the 13th, and that's an unlucky number. Nurse said that no child of hers should marry in May, so I suppose that's what brought it about. In any case, Tristram, who has been very gloomy ever since he's been here, has got to go and fight in a tournament. He says he won't be away long, and that there's no danger, not any more than crossing the sea in an open boat, which I do think is dangerous. He starts tomorrow at dawn. May 14th. Nothing particular. May 15th. No news. May 16th. Corneval arrived this evening. He says that Tristram was slightly wounded, but would be all right in a day or two. I'm very anxious. May 17th. Tristram was brought back on a litter in the middle of the night. He has been wounded in the arm. The doctors here say he was bandaged wrong by the local doctor. 
They say he is suffering from slight local pain. Corneval says the horrid henchman hit his arm as hard as he could with a broadsword. Mama and Papa arrive tomorrow with the doctor. Tristram insists on sleeping out of doors on the beach. The doctor says this is a patient's whim and must be humored. I'm sure it's bad for him, as the nights are very cold. July 1st. I've been too busy to write my diary for weeks. Tristram is still just the same. The doctors say there is no fear of immediate change. August 10th. Mama says the Queen of Cornwall, whose name is Isolt, the same as mine, is coming for a few days, with her husband and some friends. I do think it's very inconsiderate, considering how full the house is already, and what with Tristram being so ill, and insisting on sleeping on the beach. It makes it very difficult for every one. September 1st. Papa went out to shoot birds with his new crossbow, but he came back in a bad temper, as he'd only shot one and a hen. Tristram is no better. He keeps on talking about a ship with a black sail. September 19th. Today I was on the beach with Tristram, and he asked me if I saw a ship. I said I did. He asked me if the sail was black, and as the doctor had told me to humor him, I said it was. Upon which he got much worse, and I had to call the doctors. They said he was suffering from hypertrophy of the sensory nerves. September 20th. Tristram unconscious. The Queen of Cornwall just arrived. Too busy to write. End of section 2《ラストダイアリー》Section 3 of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. Lost Diaries by Marie Sparing. From the Diary of King Cofetua. Cofetua Castle, May 3rd. We had to be married in May, after all. It was a choice between that and being married on a Friday and Jane would not hear of that. So I gave in. Poor dear Mama relented at the end and came to the wedding. On the whole, she behaved with great restraint. She could not help saying just a word about rash promises. Jane looked exceedingly beautiful. I felt very proud of her. I regret nothing. We start for Italy tomorrow. We are to visit Milan, Florence, and Rome. Jane is looking forward to the change. Dijon, May 6th. We decided to break the journey here, but we shall probably start again tomorrow, as Jane is extremely dissatisfied with the inn, the Lion d'Or. I, of course, chose the best, but she says she found a spider in her bedroom. She complained that the silver plates on which dinner was served were not properly cleaned, that the veal was tough, and that we had been given grave under the guise of Barsac. All these things seem to me exceedingly trivial, but Jane is particular. In a way, it is a good thing, but considering her early upbringing and her former circumstances, I confess I am astonished. Lyon, May 12th. I shall be glad when we get to Italy. Jane becomes more and more fastidious about inns. She walked out of four running here. I was imprudent enough to say that Mama had a vassal who was a distant connection of the Sir Jehan de Blois, and Jane insisted on my paying him a visit and asking him to lodge us, telling him who we are, as we are travelling incognito as the Baron and Baroness of Wessex. This put me in a very awkward position, as I don't know him. I did it, however, and Jane came with me. I have seldom felt so awkward, but really he could not have made things easier. He was tact itself, and while respecting our incognito, he treated us with the utmost consideration. He was most kind. Jane made me a little uncomfortable by praising a fine crystal goblet encrusted with emeralds. Sur Jehan was of course obliged to offer it to her, and, to my vexation, she accepted it. Avignon, May 20th Jane finds our incognito more and more irksome. I was looking forward to a real quiet holiday, where we could get away from all fuss and worry, and all the impediments of rank and riches. I wanted to pretend we were poor for a while, to send on the litters with the oxen, the horses, and the baggage, and to ride on mules, as soon as we had reached the south. But Jane would not hear of this. She said she had had enough of poverty without playing at it now. 
this is of course quite true but i wish you wouldn't say such things before people it makes one so uncomfortable here she has insisted on our staying with the pope which may put me in a very awkward position with regard to several of our allies in italy he has been however most gracious jane is very impulsive at times she insisted on our making an expedition to the bridge here by moonlight and dancing on it she kicked off her shoes and danced barefooted i asked her not to do this whereupon she said if the courtiers hadn't praised my ankles you would never have married me and what's the use of having pretty ankles if nobody can see them i shall be glad when we get to italy i am determined to preserve a strict incognito once we are across the frontier turin june tenth it has poured with rain every day since we crossed the frontier and jane won't believe that it is ever fine in italy it is very cold for the time of year and the people here say that there has not been such a summer for thirty years every time i mention the blue sky of italy jane loses her temper she spends all her time at the goldsmith's shops and at the weaver's i am afraid she is extravagant and her taste in dress is not quite as restrained as i could wish of course it doesn't matter here but at home it would shock people for instance last night she came down to supper dressed as a turkish sultana in pink trousers and a scimitar and without even a veil over her face when i remonstrated she said men did not understand these things milan june fifteenth it is still raining jane refused to look at the cathedral and spends her whole time at the merchants booths as usual today i broached the incognito question i suggested our walking on foot or perhaps riding on mules to florence jane to my great surprise said she would be delighted to do this and asked when we were to start i said we had better start the day after tomorrow i am greatly relieved she is really very sensible if a little impulsive at times but considering her early life it might be much worse i have much to be thankful for she is greatly admired only i wish she would not wear such bright colors florence june twentieth it has been a great disappointment just as we were making preparations to start entirely incognito jane had even begged that we should walk on foot the whole way and take no clothes with us a messenger arrived from the florentine embassy here saying that the duke of florence had heard of our intended visit and had put a cavalcade of six carriages fifty mules seven litters and a hundred men-at-arms at our disposal how he could have heard of our intention i don't know jane was bitterly disappointed she cried and said she had been looking forward to this walking tour more than to anything else but i managed to soothe her and she eventually consented to accept the escort of the duke it would have been impossible to refuse as it was we were very comfortable we stopped at bologna on the way and jane insisted on going to the market and buying a sausage she tried to make me taste it but i cannot endure the taste of garlic at florence we were magnificently received and taken at once to the palace where the rooms are very spacious jane complains of the draughts and the cold it is still pouring with rain there is a very fine collection of greek statues to be seen here but jane takes no interest in these things the first thing she did was go to the new bridge which is lined with goldsmith's shops on both sides and to spend a great deal of money on perfectly useless trinkets she says she must have some things to bring back to my sisters this was thoughtful of her the duke is going to give a great banquet in our honor on tuesday night june twenty third the feast is to-night the gardens have been hung with lanterns a banquet has been prepared on a gigantic scale five hundred guests have been bidden jane was greatly looking forward to it and lo and behold by the most evil mischance a terrible vexation has befallen us a courier arrived this morning bearing letters for me and among them was one announcing the death of the duke of burgundy who is my uncle by marriage i told jane that of course we could not possibly be present at the banquet jane said that i knew best but that the duke would be mortally offended by our absence 
since he had arranged the banquet entirely for us and spent a sum of ten thousand ducats on it it would be she pointed out and i am obliged to admit she is right most impolitic to annoy the duke after an hour's reflection i hit on what seemed to me an excellent solution that we should be present but dressed in mourning jane said this was impossible as she had no black clothes then she suggested that i should keep back the news until to-morrow and if the news were received in other quarters deny its authenticity and say we had a later bulletin this on the whole seemed to be the wisest course as the etiquette here is very strict and the dowager duchess is most particular i pray that jane may be careful and guarded in her expressions june twenty fifth my poor dear mother was right after all i should have listened and now it is too late the dinner went off very well we sat at a small table on a raised dais jane sat between the duke and the prime minister and opposite the dowager duchess there was no one at the table except myself under sixty years of age and only the greatest magnates were present jane was silent and demure and becomingly dressed i congratulated myself on everything after the banquet came the dance and jane took part with exquisite grace in the saraband she observed all the rules of etiquette the dowager duchess seemed charmed with her then later came supper which was served in the tent and which was perhaps more solemn than everything when the time came to lead jane to supper she was nowhere to be found outside in the garden the minor nobles were dancing in masks and some mimes were singing we waited and then a message came that the queen had had a touch of ague and had retired the supper went off gloomily at the close an enormous pie was brought in the sight of which caused a ripple of well-bred applause viva il re cofetua was written in it in letters of pink sugar it was truly a triumph of culinary art the mime announced that the moment had come for it to be cut and as the grand duke rose to do this the thin crust burst of itself and out stepped jane with no garments beside her glorious dark hair she tripped on to the table and then with a peal of laughter leapt from it and ran into the garden since when she has not been heard of my anguish and shame are too great for words but the duke and the dowager have been most sympathetic june twenty sixth jane has fled and my jewels as well as hers are missing it is suspected that the attache at the florentine embassy at milan is at the bottom of the conspiracy for jane herself had a good heart End of section 3「Section 4 of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lost Diaries by Maurice Baring. From the Diary of Foisson, War Correspondent. Paris, the Feast of the Epiphany. The astrologers say there will be plentiful trouble in Normandy in their spring. June 10th to diner with the cardinal of pierre gore to meet the gentile king of behan and the lord charles his son the cardinal said neither the king of england nor the french king desire war but the honour of them and of their people saved they would gladly fall to in a reasonable way but the king of behan shook his head and said i am fear i am a pessimist which is almain for a man who beholds their future with no glad cheer june twentieth the great merchant of araby montefiore says there will be no war he has received word from the city of london and his friends great merchants all and notably salmon and gluckstein said likewise that there will be no war june thirtieth the coureurs have brought word home the king of england was on the sea with a great army and is now a land in normandy have received fair offers for chronicles of their war from london paris and rome 
they offer three thousand crowns monthly paying courteously for all my expenses have said i will gladly fall to their wish july first trust bag and bagage and great haste and departed toward normandy the seat of war july second ride but small journeys and do purpose being no great horseman every time i have to ride a horse to add three crowns to the expenses which my patrons courteously pay take lodgings every day between noon and three of the clock find the country fruitful and reasonably sufficient of wine july third cane a great and rich town with many burgesses crafty men they sold wine so dear that there were no buyers save myself who bought sufficient and added to the least which my patrons courteously pay july fourth amiens left cane and the englishmen have taken the town and clan robbed it right pensive as to putting my life in adventure sir godmar de fay is to keep note of the chronicleurs and he has ordained them to bring him their chronicles he has courteously made these rules for the chronicleurs chronicleurs may only chronicle the truth chronicleurs may not chronicle the names of places bridges rivers castles where battles happen nor the names of any lords knights marshals earls or others who take part in the battle nor the names of any weapons or artillery used nor the names or numbers of any prisoners taken in battle thanks to sir godmar de fay the chronicler's task has been made lighter july sixth calice the chronicler's have been ordained by sir godmar de fay to go to calice there are nine chronicler's one is an alimain who is learned in the art of war one is a genoese and one an englishman the rest are french the city of calice is full of drapery and other merchandise noble ladies and damoiselles the chroniclers have good while to stay in the city july seventh sir godmar de fay has ordained all the chroniclers to leave the city of calice and to ride to a little town called nully where there are no merchandise and no damoiselles nor sufficient of wine the chroniclers are not so merry as in the city of calice july ninth played chess with the genoese and was checkmate with a bishop august sixth the chroniclers are all pensive they are lodged in the fells there has fallen a great rain that pours down on our tents there is no wine nor pasties nor sufficient of flesh nor books for to read nor any company last night i wrote a ballad on war which ends but jean Froissart wisheth he were dead it is too indiscreet to publish i wish i were in calice i wish i were in paris i wish i were anywhere but at nolly august twenty third at the king's commandment the chroniclers are to go to the front august twenty fifth friday the king of england and the french king have ordained all the business of a battle i shall watch it and chronicle it from a hill which shall not be too far away to see and not too near to adventure my life august twenty sixth i rode to a windmill but mistook the way as a great rain fell then the air waxed clear and i saw a great many english earls and french knights riding in contrary directions in haste then many genoese went by and the englishmen began to shoot fiercely with their crossbows and their arrows fell so hotly that i rode to a little hut and finding shelter there i waited till the snow of arrows should have passed then i climbed to the top of the hill but i could see little but diverse men riding here and there when i went out again about evening song i could see no one aboot diverse knights and squires rode by looking for their masters and then it was said the king had fought a battle and had rode to the castle of broy and thence to amiens august thirtieth 
the chroniclers have been ordained to go to calais whereat they are well pleased save for a fear of a siege the chroniclers have reached the chronicle of the day of saturday twenty sixth it was a great battle right cruel and it is named the battle of crecy some of the chroniclers say the englishmen discomfited the french others that the king discomfited the english but the englishmen repute themselves to have the victory but all this shall be told in my chronicle which i shall write when i am once more in the fair city of paris it was a great battle and the french and the english lords are both well pleased at the fits of arms and the french king though the day was not as he would have had it has won high renown and is right pleased likewise the english king and his son but both kings have ordained the chroniclers to make no boast of their good adventure august thirtieth the king of england has laid siege to calais and has said he will take the town by famishing when word of this was brought to the chroniclers they were displeased it is well that i have hide in a safe place some wine and other things necessary Later. all things to eat are sold at a great price a mouse costs a crown august thirty first all the poor and mean people were constrained by the capture of calais to issue out of the town men women and children and to pass through the english host and with them the poor chroniclers and the king of england gave them and the chroniclers meat and drink to diner and every person i i d sterling in arms and the chroniclers have added to the least of their costs which their patrons courteously pay to loss of honour at receiving arms from an english king a thousand crowns end of section four section five of lost diaries this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis lost diaries by maurice sparing from the diary of george washington written when a schoolboy bridges creek seventeen forty four september twentieth my mother has at last consented to let me go to school i had repeatedly made it quite plain to her that the private tuition hitherto accorded to me was inadequate that i would be in danger of being outstripped in the race owing to insufficient groundwork my mother although very shrewd in some matters was curiously obstinate on this point she positively declined to let me attend the day school saying that she thought i knew quite enough for a boy of my age and that it would be time enough for me to go to school when i was older i quoted to her tacitus powerful phrase about the insidious danger of indolence how there is a charm in indolence but let me taste the full pleasure of transcribing the noble original subite vipe et diam ipsius inertiae docedo eam visa primo decidia postremo amatur but she only said that she did not understand latin this was scarcely an argument as i translated it for her i cannot help thinking that there was sometimes an element of pose in tacitus much vaunted terseness september twenty ninth i went to school for the first time to-day i confess i was disappointed we are reading in the fourth division in which i was placed at my mother's express request eutropius and ovid both very insipid writers the boys are lamentably backward and show a deplorable lack of interest in the classics the french master has an accent that leaves much to be desired and he seems rather shaky about his past participles however all these things are but trifles what i really resent is the gross injustice which seems to be the leading principle at the school if school it can be called for instance when the master asks a question those boys who know the answer are told to hold up their hands during the history lesson 
henry the eighth was mentioned in connection with the religious quarrels of the sixteenth century a question which i confess can have but small interest for any educated person at the present day the master asked what british poet had written a play on the subject of henry the eighth i of course held up my hand and so did a boy called jonas pike i was told to answer first and i said that the play was in the main by fletcher with possible later interpolations the usher it is scarcely credible said go to the bottom of the form and when jonas pike was asked he replied shakespeare and was told to go up one this was i consider a monstrous piece of injustice during one of the intervals which are only too frequent between the lessons the boys play a foolish game called it in which even those who have no aptitude and still less inclination for this tedious form of horseplay are compelled to take part the game consists in one boy being named it though why the neuter is used in this case instead of the obviously necessary masculine it is hard to see he has to endeavour to touch one of the other boys who in their turn do their best to evade him by running and should he succeed in touching one of them the boy who is touched becomes it ipso facto it is all very tedious and silly i was touched almost immediately and when i said that i would willingly transfer the privilege of being touched to one of the other boys who were obviously eager to obtain it one of the bigger boys again jonas pike gave me a sharp kick on the shin i confess i was ruffled i was perhaps to blame in what followed i am perhaps inclined to forget at times that providence has made me physically strong i retaliated with more insistence than i intended and in the undignified scuffle which ensued jonas pike twisted his ankle he had to be supported home when questioned as to the cause of the accident i regret to say he told a deliberate falsehood he said he had slipped on the ladder in the gymnasium i felt it my duty to inform the headmaster of the indirect and unwilling part i had played in the matter the headmaster who is positively unable to perceive the importance of plain speaking said i suppose you mean you did it i answered no sir i was resisting but not the passive agent in an unwarrantable assault the result was i was told to stay in during the afternoon and copy out the first eclogue of virgil it is characteristic of the headmaster to choose a feeble eclogue of virgil instead of one of the admirable georgics jonas pike is to be flogged as soon as his foot is well for his untruthfulness this my first experience of school life is not very hopeful october tenth the routine of the life here seems to me more and more meaningless the work is to me child's play and indeed chiefly consists in checking the inaccuracies of the ushers they show no gratitude to me indeed sometimes the reverse of gratitude one day in the english class one of the ushers grossly misquoted pope he said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing i held up my hand and asked if the line was not rather a little learning is a dangerous thing adding that pope would scarcely have thought a little knowledge to be dangerous since all knowledge is valuable the usher tried to evade the point by a joke which betrayed gross theological ignorance he said all popes are not infallible one of the boys brought into school a foolish toy a gutta-percha snake that contracts under pressure and expands when released with a whistling screech jonas pike who is the most ignorant as well as the most ill-mannered of all the boys suggested that the snake should be put in the french master's locker in which he keeps the exercises for the week the key of the locker is left in charge of the top boy of the class who i say it in all modesty is myself presently another boy hudson by name asked me for the key i gave it to him and he handed it to pike who inserted the snake in the locker when the french master opened the locker the snake flew in his face he asked me if i had had any hand in the matter i answered that i had not touched the snake he asked me if i had opened the locker i of course said no questioned further as to how the snake could have got there i admitted having lent the key to hudson ignorant of any ulterior purpose 
in spite of this i was obliged in company with pike and hudson to copy out some entirely old-fashioned and meaningless exercises in syntax october thirteenth a pretty little episode happened at home to-day the gardener's boy asked me if he might try his new axe on the old cherry tree which i have often vainly urged mother to cut down i said by all means it appears that he misunderstood me and cut down the tree my mother was about to send him away but i went straight to her and said i would take the entire responsibility for the loss of the tree on myself as i had always openly advocated its removal and that the gardener's boy was well aware of my views on the subject my mother was so much touched at my straightforwardness that she gave me some candy a refreshment to which i am still partial would that the ushers at school could share her fine discrimination her sound judgment and her appreciation of character End of section five. Section six of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo lost diaries by maurice baring from the diary of marcus aurelius rome the ides of march it is curious that julius caesar should have considered this date to be unlucky it was on that for him auspicious date that he was forever prevented from committing the egregious folly of accepting the crown of rome a king of rome is an unthinkable thing an emperor of the roman empire is of course a very different matter april first faustina in accordance with some ridiculous tradition committed a grossly undignified act she came into my study the third hour my busiest time and asked me to lend her the memoirs of Remus and the Wolf's Lair. I spent a fruitless half-hour in search for the book. It then occurred to me that the whole matter was a jest, in the very worst taste, since both my secretaries were present, and, I regret to say, they smiled. April 6th Went to the games, in company with Faustina and Commodus. Commodus, as usual, too exuberant in the manner of his applause. I am all in favor of his applauding. The games are not what they used to be. The modern lions consume the Christians without the slightest discrimination. All this modern hurry and hustle is very distressing. April 10th. Stayed at Tivoli with V and A from Saturday to Monday. Even in a country house, a day may be well spent. Much interesting talk on the fiscal question. V deprecates tariff reform in all its shapes. A, while remaining as he ever was, a staunch free trader considers that in some cases and given certain conditions retaliation is admissible possibly in the matter of the fringes of litters and the axles of chariot wheels objects which exclusively concern the very rich april twentieth an exhilarating day walked to the tiber and back read the preface of the new persian grammar faustina interrupted me three times over purely trivial matters of domestic detail april twentieth commodus is impossible he grows more and more extravagant every day he persists in spending his pocket-money in buying absurd pets 
when the god knows that Faustina has enough pets in the house already. But I'm thankful to say I've drawn the line at badgers. I put my foot down. I was dignified but firm. I endure Faustina's peacocks because I think it's good for my better nature. Besides which, they are ornamental and, if properly dressed, not unpleasant to the palate. But badgers? April 20th. A painful episode occurred. When I returned from my morning stroll, I was aware that an altercation was taking place in the atrium. I entered and found myself face to face with two Persian merchants of the lowest type, who were exhibiting to Faustina several ropes of pearls. Faustina, of course, had had no hand in the matter. The merchants had forced themselves on her presence on some ridiculous pretext. Faustina, in spite of her faults, values jewels at their true price. She has a soul above such things. She abhors trinkets. She sees their futility. April 23rd. Reread the Iliad. Find it too long. The character of Helen shows defective psychology. Homer did not understand women. April 27th. Games again. Very tame. Lions lethargic as usual. How dissatisfied Nero would have been. Nero, although a bad poet, was an excellent organizer. He understood the psychology of the crowd. He was essentially an altruist. Faustina insisted on making a foolish bet. Women's bets are the last word of silliness. They bet because the name of a gladiator reminds them of a pet dog, or for some such reason. They have no inkling of logic, no power of deduction. I found no difficulty in anticipating the victories of the successful candidates, but I refrained from making a wager. May 1st absurd processions in the streets faustina painted her face black and walked round the garden in a movable bower of greenery i could see no kind of point or sense in the episode under cross-examination she confessed that the idea had been suggested to her by her nurse all this is very trying it sets Commodus the worst possible example. But I suppose I must endure this. The ways of fate are inscrutable, and, after all, things might have been worse. Faustina might have been a loose woman, a profligate. May 6th. Read out the first canto of my epic on the origins of species to Faustina and Commodus. Commodus, I regret to say, yawned and finally dozed. Faustina enjoyed it immensely. She said she always thought that I was a real poet, and that now she knew it. She says she thinks it is far better than Homer or Virgil, that there is so much more in it. Faustina is a very good judge of literature. There is no one whose opinion on matters of art and literature I value more. For instance, she thinks Sappho's lyrics are not only trivial, but coarse. She also thinks Aeschylus much overrated, which, of course, he is. How far we have got beyond all that. Some day, I mean to write a play on the subject of love. It has never yet been properly treated, on the stage. Sophocles and Seneca knew nothing of women, and Euripides' women are far too complicated. May 12th 
meditated on religion, but was again interrupted by Faustina, just as I was making a really illuminating note on the subject of Isis. Much distressed by modern free thought, Commodus pays too much attention to the minor goddesses, but this, at his age, is excusable. He is, thank goodness, entirely untainted by the detestable Jewish or so-called Christian superstition, which I fear spreading. May 13th. V and A dined. Also a Greek philosopher, whose name escapes me. The Greek was most indiscreet. He discussed the Christian question before everybody. He must have been aware by my expression that the topic is one which I consider unfit for public discussion. He not only discussed, but he actually defended this hysterical, obstinate, unpatriotic, and fundamentally criminal sect. I do not, of course, entirely credit the stories current with regard to their orgies and their human sacrifices. The evidence is not, so far, sufficiently sound. But, whatever their practices and their rights may be, the Christians are a pernicious and dangerous sect. They will prove, unless they are extirpated, the ruin of the empire. They have no notion of civic duty, no reverence, no respect for custom or tradition. They are unfilial, and they are the enemies of the human race. They are cancer in the state. Faustina agrees with me, I am glad to say. May 14th. Commodus is suspected of having made friends with a Christian slave. The rumor is no doubt a calumny. I cannot bring myself to believe that a son of mine, with the education which he has enjoyed and the example which has ever been before his eyes, of his father's unswerving and unremitting devotion to duty and the state, can have degraded himself by dabbling in this degrading and wicked superstition. Nevertheless, it is as well to be on the safe side, and, after prolonged reflection, I have decided to make a great sacrifice. I am going to allow him to take part professionally in the games. Under another name, of course. I think it may distract him. The games are a Roman institution. They are the expression of the empire. They breathe the spirit of Romulus, of Brutus, of Regulus, of Fabius Cunctator, of Cincinnatus, of the Gracchi. Faustina said only yesterday that she felt she was the mother of at least one Gracchus. That was well said. I was much touched. May 20th. Commodus has appeared with great success, but the lions still show apathy. End of section 6. Section 7 of Lost Diaries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Lost Diaries by Maurice Baring. From the Diary of Mrs. James Lee's Husband. October 1st. At last, the heat wave is over. It's the first day we have been able to breathe for months. Just as I was coming back from my morning walk, Hilda leant out of the window and suggested I could climb up into a room like Romeo. I said I preferred the door. Hilda shut the window with a bang and was cross all through luncheon. Rizoles again, I said to Hilda. You know I hate hashed meat. She said, 
I know I can't give you the food you get at the Grand Hotel. That's because I went to Duville last week. October 5th We lit a fire for the first time last night. Hilda said she felt cold. I thought it was rather stuffy. She said, Do light the fire, and went out of the room. I lit it, and it smoked. This chimney always does smoke at first. When she came back, she said, What have you done? I said, I've lit the fire you asked me to. She said, But not all that wood at once, and you ought to have pushed the wood back. For the rest of the evening, she complained of the heat and the smoke, although we had the window open in the dining room, and the smoke had all disappeared after a few moments. October 7th. It's very windy. Went for a walk on the cliffs. Back through the fields. Saw a rabbit and a magpie. Wish I had had a gun. I said to Hilda that the sea was striped to leeward like a snake, in olive-colored, but on the weather side it was spotted with wind. Hilda said, You are very observant about the weather. This was a hit at me and the fire. Little things rankle in her mind. Afterwards she was sorry she had said this, and she said, What fun we shall have here in winter! I don't think it's a winter place myself, but I want to stay here till I finished my poem. I'm getting on with it. October 8th I read out to Hilda a lyric I just finished. It's to come in the second canto, when Lancelot says goodbye to Princess Azra. The situation is roughly that the princess bullies him and he gets sick of it and goes. And then, of course, she's sorry when it's too late. He sings the song as he's going. She overhears it. I was rather pleased with it. Hilda said, Oh, of course, I know I worry you with my attentions. What this had got to do with a poem, I can't think. It was all because last night, when I was working, Hilda came into my room and said, are you warm enough? And I said yes, rather absent-mindedly, as I was in the middle of my work. Ten minutes later she looked in again and asked me if I wanted some beer, and I said no without looking up. Then very soon afterwards she came in a third time and asked me if I was sure I wasn't cold and whether I wouldn't have the fire lit. Rather snappishly, because it is a bore to be interrupted, just when one's on the verge of getting an idea fixed. I said, no. I'm afraid this hurt her feelings. October 9th Since Hilda has given up her sketching, she has nothing to do. I was very busy this afternoon finishing my weekly article in time for the post. She rushed into the room and said, didn't I think a butterfly settling on a jock was the ultimate symbol of love in the mind of man? I said, I thought she was very probably right. Heavens knows what she meant. Women's minds move by jerks. One never knows what they'll say next. They're so irrelevant. October 10th It's blowing a gale stuck in the poem hilda says it's cynical i don't know what she means she says she didn't know i was so bitter i said it's only a kind of fairy tale she said yes but that makes it worse but it's only an ordinary love story i said she said of course i know nothing can go on being the same it can no doubt be better, but not the same as it was before. But Princess Azra is only an incident in my poem, I said. Hilda said nothing. 
but after a time she asked me whether i thought that was the meaning of the moan of the wind i have no idea what she meant by that she is very cryptic sometimes october eleventh lovely day the sun came out and i suggested that i should take a holiday and that we should go and have a picnic on the rocks i was afraid hilda might have something against the plan one never knows but she didn't on the contrary she seemed delighted she made a hamper and i carried it down to the rocks we caught shrimps and threw stones into the sea just like children i think hilda enjoyed herself on the way home i asked her why she didn't go on with her drawing i really think it's a great pity she has given it up she has real talent she said i will if you wish it i said of course i don't want you to do it if you don't like but i do think it's a pity to waste such a very real talent she said i quite understand and sighed i wonder what she was thinking of hilda is absurdly modest she draws extremely well especially figures october twelfth hilda has begun drawing again i am delighted she began copying the cast of a hand but i suggested to her that it would be far more interesting for her to draw a real hand from nature so she got a little girl from the village to sit for her i am delighted it gives her an occupation and i really am very busy just now after all we came here so as not to be disturbed to be away from people and interruptions and i find that in the last two months i've got through less work than i did in london in june i must make up for lost time i can't get on with a poem i think i shall leave it for a time i should immensely like hilda's opinion on what ought to happen next she can be of the greatest help and use when she chooses unfortunately she has taken one of those unreasonable and entirely unaccountable dislikes to this poem and no argument is of the slightest use it's no good even mentioning it i shall leave it for a time and go on with my other work it is most unfortunate that hilda should look upon it in this light especially as she doesn't even know what the subject is but she has taken an episode in fact one little song as symbolic of the whole but then logic never was hilda's strong point october thirteenth hilda is getting on very well with a hand she seems to enjoy it which is the great thing october twenty fourth have been too busy all these last days thinking even to write my diary believe i have at last really got an idea for the poem shall begin tomorrow have not dared mention it to hilda fortunately she is still utterly absorbed in her drawing october twenty seven great disappointment last night hilda said it was no good concealing things any longer and that one must look facts in the face i had no idea what she meant then she said she had noticed for some time past how bored i was here and how i was longing to get rid of her nothing i could say would persuade her of the contrary i tried to explain that i had been searching for a new idea and that this had no doubt made me appear more absent-minded than usual she said i am not going to worry you any longer i am going to set you free and to my intense surprise she announced that she had booked a berth on the steamer for the day after tomorrow i knew that argument wouldn't be of any use so i gave in at once 
it is most disappointing just as i had got an idea i wanted to consult her about october twenty ninth on board the steamer queen marguerite saw hilda off she insisted on going and refused to argue deeply regret she is leaving hilda is the only woman i ever met who remains tidy even on a steamer the sea air suits her it has done her a world of good and it's a great pity she is leaving so soon she says it's for good but that of course is ridiculous End of section 7section eight of lost diaries this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b lost diaries by maurice baring from the diary of sherlock holmes baker street january first starting a diary in order to jot down a few useful incidents will be of no use to watson watson very often fails to see that an unsuccessful case is more interesting from a professional point of view than a successful case he means well january sixth watson has gone to brighton for a few days for change of air this morning quite an interesting little incident happened which i note as a useful example of how sometimes people who have no powers of deduction nevertheless stumble on the truth for the wrong reasons this never happens to watson fortunately lestrade called from scotland yard with reference to the theft of a diamond and ruby ring from lady dorothy smith's wedding presents the facts of the case were briefly these on thursday evening such of the presents as were jewels had been brought down from lady dorothy's bedroom to the drawing-room to be shown to an admiring group of friends the ring was amongst them after they had been shown the jewels were taken upstairs once more and locked in the safe the next morning the ring was missing lestrade after investigating the matter came to the conclusion that the ring had not been stolen but had either been dropped in the drawing-room or replaced in one of the other cases but since he had searched the room and the remaining cases his theory so far received no support i accompanied him to eaton square to the residence of lady middlesex lady dorothy's mother while we were engaged in searching the drawing-room lestrade uttered a cry of triumph and produced the ring from the lining of the armchair i told him he might enjoy the triumph but that the matter was not quite so simple as he seemed to think a glance at the ring had shown me not only that the stones were false but that the false ring had been made in a hurry to deduce the name of its maker was of course child's play lestrade or any pupil of scotland yard would have taken for granted it was the same jeweller who had made the real ring i asked for the bridegroom's present and in a short time i was interviewing the jeweller who had provided it as i thought he had made a ring with imitation stones made of the dust of real stones a week ago for a young lady she had given no name and had fetched and paid for it herself i deduced the obvious fact that lady dorothy had lost the real ring her uncle's gift and not daring to say so had had an imitation ring made i returned to the house where i found lestrade who had called to make arrangements for watching the presents during their exhibition i asked for lady dorothy who at once said to me the ring was found yesterday by mr lestrade i know i answered but which ring she could not repress a slight twitch of the eyelids as she said there was only one ring i told her of my discovery and of my investigations this is a very odd coincidence mr holmes she said some one else must have ordered an imitation but you shall examine my ring for yourself whereupon she fetched the ring and i saw it was no imitation she had of course in the meantime found the real ring but to my intense annoyance she took it to lestrade and said to him isn't this the ring you found yesterday mr lestrade lestrade examined it and said of course it is absolutely identical in every respect 
and do you think it is an imitation asked this most provoking young lady certainly not said lestrade and turning to me he added ah holmes that is where theory leads one at the yard we go in for facts i could say nothing but as i said good-bye to lady dorothy i congratulated her on having found the real ring the incident although it proved the correctness of my reasoning was vexing as it gave that ignorant blunderer an opportunity of crowing over me january tenth a man called just as watson and i were having breakfast he didn't give his name he asked me if i knew who he was i said beyond seeing that you are unmarried that you have travelled up this morning from sussex that you have served in the french army that you write for reviews and are specially interested in the battles of the middle ages that you give lectures that you are a roman catholic and that you have once been to japan i don't know who you are the man replied that he was unmarried but that he lived in manchester that he had never been to sussex or japan that he had never written a line in his life that he had never served in any army save the english territorial force that so far from being a roman catholic he was a freemason and that he was by trade an electrical engineer i suspected him of lying and i asked him why his boots were covered with the clay and chalk mixture peculiar to horsham why his boots were french army service boots elastic sided and bought probably at valmy why the second half of a return ticket from southwater was emerging from his ticket pocket why he wore the medal of st anthony on his watch chain why he smoked caporal cigarettes why the proofs of an article on the battle of Elo were protruding from his breast pocket together with a copy of the tablet why he carried in his hand a parcel which owing to the untidy way in which it had been made an untidiness which in harmony with the rest of his clothes showed that he could not be married revealed the fact that it contained photographic magic lantern slides and why he was tattooed on the left wrist with a japanese fish the reason i have come to consult you will explain some of these things he answered i was staying last night at the windsor hotel and this morning when i woke up i found an entirely different set of clothes from my own i called the waiter and pointed this out but neither the waiter nor any of the other servants after making full inquiries were able to account for the change none of the other occupants of the hotel had complained of anything being wrong with their own clothes two gentlemen had gone out early from the hotel at seven thirty one of them had left for good the other was expected to return all the belongings i am wearing including this parcel which contains slides belong to someone else my own things containing nothing valuable and consisted of clothes and boots very similar to these my coat was also stuffed with papers as to the tattoo it was done at a turkish bath by a shampooer who learnt the trick in the navy the case did not present any features of the slightest interest i merely advised the man to return to the hotel and await the real owner of the clothes who was evidently the man who had gone out at seven thirty this is a case of my reasoning being with one partial exception perfectly correct everything i had deduced would no doubt have fitted the real owner of the clothes watson asked rather irrelevantly why i had not noticed that the clothes were not the man's own clothes a stupid question as the clothes were reach-me-downs which fitted him as well as such clothes ever do fit and he was probably of the same build as their rightful owner january twelfth found a carbuncle of unusual size in the plum pudding suspected the makings of an interesting case but luckily before i had stated my hypothesis to watson who was greatly excited mrs turner came in and noticed it and said her naughty nephew bill had been at his tricks again and that the red stone had come from a christmas tree of course i had not examined the stone with my lens end of section eight section nine of lost diaries this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Lost Diaries by Maurice Baring From the Diary of the Emperor Titus 
titus reginum berenicum cui eption nuptius policitus verbator statim ab urbe demisit invitus invitum tacitus rome monday the eruption at vesuvius does not after all appear to have been greatly exaggerated as i had first had thought on receiving pliny's graphic letter one never can quite trust literary men when facts are in question it is clear that i missed a very fine and interesting spectacle in fact i have lost a day good phrase that must try and bring it in some time or other tuesday I fear there is no doubt of Berenice's growing unpopularity. It is tiresome, as I was hoping that the marriage might take place soon, quietly. She insists on wearing a diadem, which is unnecessary, and her earrings, made of emeralds and gold cupids, are too large. She asked me, today, if I didn't think she resembled the Rose of Sharon. I said, I suppose she meant the Rose of Pestum. She said, Ah, you've never read the Song of Songs. I said, I had read all Sappho. She said, It's not by Sappho. It's by Solomon. I had no idea King Solomon wrote. Wednesday berenice has asked some of her relations to stay with her they arrived this morning her mother her sister her younger brother and her cousin they are very conversational they chatter together like parrots or cockatoos they are also insatiably inquisitive talked finance with paulinus he says the treasury is practically empty. Nobody in the palace appears to have any ready money. When the usual crowd of beggars came to the palace this evening for their daily allowance, I had to send them away. It was the first time. Paulinus remarked that I had let a day go by without making a gift. Yes, I answered, I have lost a day. The phrase, I am glad to say, was heard by everybody. I afterwards borrowed a little money from Berenice's brother, who made no difficulties. He is a nice, generous lad, if a little talkative. But then we all of us have our faults. Berenice's mother loses no opportunity of asking when the wedding day is to be. Most awkward. I temporized. Thursday berenice's relations have spread the news in the court by telling it to one of the matrons in strict confidence that i am about to marry berenice almost immediately this is most unfortunate the news has created a sensation and they all say that such a match would be more than unpopular amongst the people berenice has not mentioned it herself lost heavily at dice yesterday accepted the offer of berenice's brother to lend me a lump sum instead of constantly borrowing small coins i have no doubt that is the wiser course thursday a week later the strain on my purse is terrible had of course to subscribe largely to the pompeii and a Herculaneum fund, also to the Pestilence Relief, also to the Flavian Amphitheatre fund. Borrowed another lump sum from Berenice's brother. He is certainly very good natured. Berenice's mother again referred to the marriage question. I said this was an unlucky month for marriages. Not if you are born in December, she answered. Unfortunately, I was born in December. Friday. Do not know where to turn for money. 
do not always want to be borrowing from Berenice's brother. Somehow or other, it makes them all so familiar. Given the circumstances, in the extreme unpopularity of their presence here, it is awkward. Besides, it is a shame to trade on the good nature of a youth. Have sold all the decorations of the imperial residence and devoted a portion of the proceeds to the relief fund. Someone spread the rumor among the dear people that I had devoted the whole of the money to the relief fund. I cannot think how these rumors get about. Saturday, a week later. This has been a most expensive fortnight. I've had to do a lot of entertaining, and I regret to say, I have been once more obliged to borrow a lump sum from Berenice's brother. How I shall ever be able to pay him back the gods alone know. Had the news of my marriage unofficially announced, followed immediately by a semi-official and ambiguous denial, made to see what effect the news would have among the public. Paulinus says the impression produced was deplorable. The Romans cannot, he says, forget that Berenice is a queen. Of course they can't, if she will wear a crown. People say, he says, that even Nero and Caligula avoided offending public opinion on this point. They refer also to Julius Caesar's action on the Lupercal. There is no doubt that such a course will ensure me a lasting unpopularity. But what is to be done? Berenice's relations talk of the marriage as a matter of course. I have practically promised marriage. Berenice herself says nothing, but her silence is eloquent. Her brother becomes more and more familiar, impresses me to accept further loans. I do my best to refuse, and I have made a vow that the lump sum which he lent me today shall be positively the last one. Monday Paulinus tells me that the Senate have decided to present me with a monster petition against my marriage. Since it is obviously impossible, owing to the strong feeling raised and the present excited state of popular opinion, I have resolved to anticipate events, and I have given leave to Paulinus to contradict officially the rumors of my impending marriage. He is to add, unofficially, that Berenice is shortly leaving Rome for change of air, and that she will probably spend the summer months in her charming villa on the Dead Sea. In the meantime, I have got to break the news to Berenice before tomorrow morning. Antiochus, the king of Comagene, arrived here this morning. More expense. Monday night, later. The crisis is partially over. It has been extremely painful. Berenice, at first, was incredulous. Then she was upset and left me, threatening to kill herself. I sent Paulinus to try and calm her. She then said she would leave Rome without setting eyes on me again, and state her reason in an open letter which she would issue for private circulation only. This, of course, would have been most undesirable. Her mother and sister backed her up and threw up at me the example of Antony, taunting me with cowardice, of being afraid of the Senate, and of outraging the dignity of a family, royal in rank and of immemorial lineage. Berenice is directly descended from King Solomon on her mother's side. Finally, Berenice's brother came to me and said that as he would shortly be leaving Rome, he would be obliged if I could pay him back the trifling loans he had favored me with. He brought a list of them. He charges interest. It is a tradition, he says, in his family to charge 90% interest on royal loans. He said that he was quite willing to apply to the Senate if the reimbursement in any way incommoded me. 
This was a great shock to me. Immediate repayment was and is impossible. The marriage is equally impossible. I told Berenice, frankly, that I could not remain in Rome as emperor and the husband of a foreign queen. She said, but why shouldn't I be empress? Women-like, she missed the point. I said I was willing to follow her to her villa and renounce all claim to the empire. Having offered her this alternative, I summon Antiochus, who is an old friend of hers, to be the arbiter. As soon as the facts were put before him, I left them, and Antiochus had a lengthy interview with Berenice in private. I was convinced this was the best course. At the end of it, Berenice generously refused to accept my sacrifice and while renouncing all idea of self-slaughter or retaliation, announced her intention of leaving Rome. But those loans, and their terrible interest, that matter is still unsettled. Tuesday. All has been settled. Antiochus has lent me the whole sum due to Berenice's brother, and a handsome margin for my personal use. I restored the interest and capital of the loan to Berenice's brother, said farewell to the family before the whole court, and handed Berenice's brother a fine gold chain as a slight token of my esteem. This, he said, is too much. No man, I answered, should leave his prince's presence dissatisfied. Hereupon the whole court murmured applause and by a slight gesture I indicated that the audience was at an end. Berenice, alas, left Rome at noon, escorted by Antiochus, who was to spend the summer with her in Palestine. Today I can say in all conscientiousness that I have not lost a day, but it seems to me that I have lost everything else that there is to lose in this life. End of section 9。section 10 of lost diaries。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by betty b。lost diaries by maurice baring。from the diary of harriet shelley。George Street, Edinburgh, September 6, 1811. Mr. Hogg arrived this morning. He seemed at first to be quite oblivious of the fact that he was in the city of the unfortunate Queen Mary. Bish and I conducted him to the Palace of Holyrood immediately, where we inspected the instructive and elegant series of portraits of the Scottish kings. I was much affected by the sight of the unfortunate Queen's bedroom. Mr. Hogg has not been well grounded in history, and he was on more than one occasion inaccurate. He had never heard of Fergus the Just. Bish was much moved and enchanted by the objects of interest. He ran through the rooms at a great pace, now and then pointing back at an object of interest and exclaiming, That is good. I regretted the absence of Eliza, but perhaps it is as well that she was not with us on this occasion she would not have permitted me to contemplate the tragic stain of rizzio's wound for fear of the effect the sight might have on my nerves mr hogg was strangely insensible to the sorrowful associations of the spot after we had inspected the rooms and the relics bish with intent eye with renewed awe and mr hogg with a somewhat inopportune levity bish was obliged to go home and write letters and so i suggested that mr hogg should conduct me to arthur's seat in order to enjoy the sublime prospect which that eminence commands so sublime so grand so inspiring was the view that even mr hogg was impressed as for myself words fail to express the manifold and conflicting emotions which were stirred in my breast the weather was fine clear and tranquil but alas no sooner had we started on our descent then the wind began to blow with great violence 
it was of course impossible for me in such circumstances to risk the impropriety which might be occasioned had the wind as was only too probable so disturbed my dress as to reveal to my companion the indelicate spectacle of my decently concealed ankles so i seated myself on a rock resolving to wait until the violence of the wind should subside mr hogg who laid unnecessary stress on the fact that he had not dined on either of the preceding days and being deficient in a proper sense of delicacy and seemliness vowed he would desert me and proceed home by himself to my dismay he began to carry his threat into execution and it was with the utmost difficulty that i succeeded in accomplishing the descent without affording him any unseemly exhibition sunday the manner in which the sabbath is observed in the city is repellent to my principles bish and mr hogg have gone to the kirk i pleaded the wearisome performance would be certain in my case to bring on a headache and so i remained at home they returned much exhausted by the wrestlings of an eminent divine with satan i am engaged in translating madame cotin's immortal claire d'albe into english prose this occupies my morning bish is translating a treatise of buffon with which we were both of us charmed in the evenings i read out telemachus i regret to say that bish fell asleep while i was but halfway through an instructive discourse of idomeneus relating to the wise laws of crete mr hogg is an attentive listener and it is a pleasure to read to him york october tenth eighteen eleven travelled by post chaise from darlington read anna st ives by holcroft in the chaise throughout the journey bish was restless and suggested my skipping certain portions of the narrative i of course declined knowing that it was the intention of the authoress that her work should be read without omissions bish is obliged to go to london in the evenings i read out dr robertson's historical works to mr hogg we are on the eve of a great event my dear sister eliza has consented to visit us and is about to arrive what a privilege for mr hogg what a source of pleasure for bish i ardently regret that he should not be present to welcome her october twenty fifth eliza has arrived i am deeply touched by her kindness in coming and overcome when i think what a joyful surprise her presence will be for bis and how it will illuminate our household october twenty sixth bish arrived from london eliza spent the day brushing her hair in the evening i suggested reading aloud from holcroft but eliza such as her kind-heartedness feared that it might upset my nerves she felt certain too that her esteemed friend miss warne whom she regards as a pattern and model in all things would not approve of holcroft october twenty sixth eliza is certain that miss warren would find nothing to admire in york minster changed our lodgings eliza thinks that the pure mountain air of the lakes would be salutary to my nerves bish and mr hogg miss our evening readings i sometimes however continue to read to them in an undertone when eliza is brushing her hair but the pleasure is marred by the trepidation i am in lest i should disturb her eliza objects to the name bish she is certain miss warren could not endure such a name so in future my husband shall be called percy it is certainly prettier and more romantic keswick november sixteenth we have made the acquaintance of the southies mr southey is a great reader and devotes two hours daily to the study of the portuguese and spanish languages mrs southey is an adept at book binding and binds her husband's book with elegance and neatness bish i mean percy has alas three times nearly risked offending the poet the first time by inadvertently taking a book down from one of his bookshelves the second time by falling asleep when mr southey after having locked him into his study was reading aloud to him his epic the curse of kahama and the third time by sharply criticizing his action in eating tea cakes and by subsequently devouring a whole plate of them himself bish i mean percy has implored me to beg mrs southey to instruct me in the art of making tea cakes i wish eliza could begin to realize 
the existence of bysshe i mean percy she seems altogether unaware of his presence in the house but then eliza is so much occupied in considering what will be best for me that she has no time to bestow any attention to any one else percy is contemplating the composition of a poem which is to be called queen mab eliza said that miss warren had a horror of queen mab bish explained to her that his poem was to be didactic and philosophical and had nothing to do with fairies that said eliza makes it worse bish ran out of the room with shrill exclamation of impatience hush hush said eliza think of poor harriet's nerves november twentieth bish confessed to me that he could see neither beauty nor charm in eliza this is curious since her black hair has always been an object of universal admiration i am afraid that eliza does not understand him i need hardly say what a disappointment this is to me bish and i were thinking of writing a novel in collaboration but eliza said that miss warren considered that it was not seemly for a woman to dabble in fiction bish i mean percy in writing i find it difficult to accustom myself to the new name but i am fortunately successful in the presence of eliza in always saying percy percy and i are thinking of studying hebrew i have not yet told eliza of this project she is opposed to my reading latin authors in their original tongue november thirtieth we were walking this afternoon in the neighborhood of the lake percy eliza and myself percy was talking of plato's republic when eliza interrupted him by recalling to his mind something which she had indeed often mentioned before namely miss warren's positive dislike of all the greek authors and especially plato scarcely had she uttered these words when we looked round and found that bish had vanished in silence like a ghost in the trees we called and searched for him in vain but when we returned to the house we found him awaiting us buried in a book the incident greatly displeased eliza and she insisted upon my taking to my bed as soon as we got home although i confess i felt no suspicion of any ailment nor would she hear of my reading either aloud or to myself she sat by my bedside brushing her hair she grieved me by saying that she could not conceive what miss warren would think of bish i mean percy end of section ten section eleven of lost diaries this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis lost diaries by maurice sparing from the journal lantime of the emperor tiberius february first disquieting news from parthia artabanus is giving trouble again shall probably have to send an expedition the military party in rome say that there will probably be unrest in thrace in the spring i remember they said the same thing last year slept wretchedly last night Clericles' medicine is worse than useless wrote three dispatches and one private letter fed hannibal the tortoise went for a stroll in the afternoon picked the first windflower and put it in water the gardener says we shall have some rain shortly please the gods this may be true as the country needs it badly dined alone played spillikins after dinner with fufius but found it a strain february second woke at four and remained awake until seven then went to sleep again and overslept myself scolded balbus for not calling me he said he did not dare call me more emphatically told him it must not occur again february third nothing particular february fourth letter from my mother begging me to come and see her says she is suffering from lung trouble women are so unreasonable she must realize that it is impossible for me to get away just at present hannibal would not touch his lettuce to-day this is the third day running it has happened Clericles has given him some medicine strolled along to cliffs in the morning much vexed by a fisherman 
who pushed a lobster under my very nose i have a horror of shellfish varus and ophidius dined found their conversation a strain so retired early read the seventh book of the aeneid but found it insipid virgil will certainly not live he was a sycophant february tenth anniversary of poor julia's death began to write short poem on the subject but was interrupted by the arrival of the courier from rome much vexed as it altogether interrupted my train of thought and spoilt what would have been a fine elegy news from rome unsatisfactory it rained in the afternoon so i did not go out sorted my specimens of dried herbs which are in a sad state of confusion dined alone dictated a dispatch to sejanus read some of the alcestis euripides before going to bed alcestis reminds me of julia in many ways she had the same fervid altruism and the same knack of saying really disagreeable things but they both meant well march first a lovely spring day went for a stroll and jotted down a few ideas for a poem on spring the birds were singing listened for some time to the babbling of the brook think of alluding to this in the poem de silientis aquae would make a good ending to a pentameter mentioned it to fufius when i came in casually he said he did not think it was very original fufius is hypercritical he does not feel poetry finish the memorial lines on julia ending ave aquivale shall not show them to fufius he would be certain to say something disparaging positively haunted by the sight of the wild tulips in the hills fluttering in the breeze sights like this live in the memory disturbed early in the morning by a noise of hammering it is strange that wherever i go this happens made inquiries and ascertained that the stable roof is being repaired if it is not the stable roof it is sure to be something else last week it was a strayed cow which woke me at five find it very difficult to get to sleep in the early morning whatever precautions i take in a month's time the nightingales will begin and then sleep will be out of the question thinking of writing a poem called to sleep march tenth clerically says i am overworked and need a change have decided to go for a short walking tour quite by myself thought of taking fluffius but knowing how self-willed he is decided not to packed my knapsack took an extra pair of sandals a worsted scarf an ivory comb two gold toothpicks and a volume of sappho's songs find this light feminine verse suitable for outdoor life shall start early tomorrow had my hair cut the slave was clumsy when cutting round the ears they still smart find this fault to be universal among hair cutters shall take tablets with me in order to jot down any ideas for future poems although Clericles advises me to give up writing for two or three weeks march thirteenth returned earlier than i expected walking tours successful on the whole visited sorrentum an idyllic spot not sure i don't prefer it to capri it is a curious thing that man is always discontented with what he has and hankers after what he has not got walked leisurely the first day stopping every now and then for light refreshment found the country people very civil and anxious to please nobody knew who i was and i was intensely gratified by many spontaneous and frank experiences of loyalty and devotion to the emperor this is refreshing in this sceptical age it is a comfort to think that although i may not go down to posterity as a great military genius like julius caesar i shall at least leave a blameless name as far as my domestic life is concerned and an untarnished reputation for benevolence kindness and unswerving devotion to duty without being conceited i think that some of my verse will live i think i shall be among the roman poets when i die but this is not saying much when one considers the absurd praise given to poetasters such as virgil and ponticus 
strolling along the seashore near sorrentum a very pretty little episode occurred a woman one of the fishermen's wives was sitting by her cottage door spinning her child a little girl about six years old was playing with a doll hard by i said good day to the fisherman's wife and she offered me a glass of wine i declined as Clericles has forbidden me red wine but i said i would gladly accept a bowl of milk she immediately went to fetch it and the child went with her when they returned the child offered me the bowl lisping in a charming manner i drank the milk and the mother then said to the child tell the kind gentleman whom you love best in the world papa and mamma lisped the child and after that asked the mother after that the divine emperor tiberius who is the father and the mother of us all she said i gave the mother a gold piece fufius says it is a mistake to give money to the poor and that it pauperizes them he says one does more harm than good by indiscriminate charity but i think it cannot be a bad thing to follow the impulses of the heart i should like this to be said of me although he had many faults such as discontent and want of boldness his heart was in the right place it is little incidents like the one i noted above which make up for the many disappointments and trials of a monarch's life the second day of my tour was marred by a thunder shower but i found a thrush's nest and three eggs in it there are few things which move me so inexpressibly as the sight of a thrush's nest with the eggs lying in it it is curious that the nightingale's egg should be so ugly owing to the bad weather and the rheumatism in my joints which it brought on i was obliged to cut short my tour this extract probably belongs to a later period june asinius gallus has again sent in a petition about the prison fair it appears he has a conscientious objection to eating veal the officials say they can do nothing if they make an exception in his favor they will be obliged to do so in many less deserving cases i confess these little things worry me our prison system seems to me lacking in elasticity but it is dreadfully difficult to bring into effect any sweeping reform because if the prison disciplinary system is modified to meet the requirements of the more cultivated prisoners the prisons would be crowded with ruffians who would get themselves arrested on purpose at least this is the official view and it is shared by sejanus who has gone into the matter thoroughly i confess it leaves me unconvinced i am glad to say we are ahead of the persians in the matter in persia they think nothing of shutting up a prisoner of whatever rank in a cell and keeping him isolated from the world sometimes for as long as three months at a time this seems to me barbarous july sixth the heat is overpowering agrippina threatens to come home and to bring her daughter i wrote saying i thought it is very unwise to bring children here at this time of year owing to the prevalence of fever she answered that her daughter was looking forward to the sea bathing if they come it will mean that my summer will be ruined july seventh i went to the home farm this afternoon the farmer's wife is very ill there is little or no hope of her recovery spent two hours there reading out passages of the odyssey she does not understand greek but it seemed to soothe her her husband told her that he felt confident that she could not get worse after this the faith of these simple folk is most touching how unlike fufius and all his friends august first there is no news except that as always occurs at this time of year the phoenix is reported to have been seen in egypt august third one of those distressing little incidents happened today which entirely spoil one's comfort and peace of mind for the moment just like a piece of dust getting into one's eye my old friend lucius anusius came all the way from rhodes to see me by some mistake he was shown into the chamber where prisoners are examined and before the error was rectified he was rather rudely interrogated it turned out afterward that balbus mistook him for titus anusius the informer 
Balbus is growing more and more stupid. He forgets everything. I ought to send him away. On the other hand, he knows my habits, and I should feel lost without him. As it is, Clericles says that Lucius is like to feel it for several days. He is so sensitive, and the slightest thing upsets his nerves. All his family are touchy, and I am afraid he will look upon the matter as a deliberate slight. If it had happened to anyone else, it would not have mattered. They would have understood at once. This has quite put me out, but, as Fufia says, how little I shall think of this in a year's time. August 7th. Lucius Anusius has left the island in a huff. <sighs> it is most regrettable. August 12th. Agrippina arrives tomorrow. There is nothing to be done. How pleasant life would be were it not for one's relations. End of section 11